Hey, good morning. morning. Happy Father's Day. Nobody really knows what to say back to that. It's like, you too, I guess. (laughs) Fathers in, in our modern era are responsible for really two things. It's very easy to be a father nowadays, two things. First thing is dad joke. You've got to be well-versed in the dad joke. I heard one recently. I'm going to share with you if you don't have one. Okay, you have one now. I dated a girl. She was really into Star Wars, loved Star Wars so much she got a tattoo right here. You should see the Luke on her face. There's a Luke Skywalker. See, it's on his front of her face. The other thing that dads have to be good at nowadays is the hard conversation. I feel like in generations past, you could kind of get away with being like the non-emotional kind of like go talk to your mom kind of person. Uh, we don't share emotions. But nowadays, dads have to be able to engage in the hard conversation. We've got to be able to talk about things that are difficult, things that are challenging uh, with our kids. Talk about emotional stuff, things that, that maybe have made other people uh, in previous generations squeamish. And so we're walking through the book of Matthew. And one of the things that you see in the book of Matthew is Jesus is not afraid to have the hard conversation. It's all over the book. I mean, two weeks ago, he called a woman a dog. That's a hard conversation. Last week, we had the, the centurion, Right? That's a hard conversation to have with the city around you saying that they're condemned. Jesus has hard conversations about divorce and remarriage. He has hard conversations about the condition of the heart. And today he has another hard conversation with a rich young man. And there's going to be a hard conversation for us today. Because we are, every single person in this room, most people watching online, if you make $30,000 a year or more, you are a rich person. You're wealthy. You're in the top 1% of earners globally, and you're in the top 1% historically. By every definition, you and I are rich people, materially rich. But we don't like to say that, right? In our culture, we don't like to talk about money. We get uncomfortable about it, right? If somebody asks you if you're rich, you get squeamish, right? If I ask you how much you make, you get offended, I ask you, I say, would you say you're a rich person? Would you say you're wealthy? You say, no, 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 no. You say, we do all right. That's like our way of being like, no, we do all right. Or, you know, we can take care of our needs. Or we church people, this is my favorite one, we're blessed. And we say it just like that. Like we say it real softly, we're blessed. Like if we say it too loudly, the money will just (laughs) disappear, right? So we have to say it blessed. And you got to grab your chest. Blessed. Money is a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing. It's a hard conversation we're going to have today about money. But it starts with you recognizing that you're wealthy and saying you're rich. Wealth has a tendency to get in the way of you pursuing Jesus. And if you let it go on cruise control, if you think, oh, it'll take care of itself, wealth's not a problem for me. That may be the case now, but if you adopt that attitude throughout your entire life, It will be. Money is something that has to be kept an eye on. So we're in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 30. We're going to talk about how wealth can impact our following of Jesus. And we really have three options that we can do with our money. We can keep it. We can leave it. And then there's a third option that we'll talk about. So let's talk about keeping everything. Keeping everything. That's one way we can go. Verse 16 of chapter 19, and behold, a man came up to him, that's Jesus, saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, all of these I have kept, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And when the rich young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. This is his final trip to Jerusalem. And he has uh, met three people so far, three groups of people on his way. He's met a group of kids, he's met some religious leaders, and now he's met 
this rich young man. And this man is an incredibly complicated person. He's kind of a gray figure in the Bible. I don't know if I'm supposed to like him and feel bad for him or if I'm supposed to be like, ah, what a, what a jerk. On one hand, I feel bad for him because he was this close to the kingdom of heaven, this close. And he turns aside. He's a tragic figure in that regard. On the other hand, kind of comes across as a wealthy snob. Kind of seems full of himself. How am I supposed to feel about this guy? His conversation with Jesus even indicates that he's a little bit of a gray character, right? He asks Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Which is a great question. It shows he's spiritually sensitive. He wants to know what God is doing and he wants to be a part of it. On the other hand, we know that you can't work to earn your salvation. So is it really that great of a question? His approach to the law seems to be gray as well. Jesus tells him to keep the law. Don't murder, don't steal, don't do this, don't do that. And it sounds like that's a really great thing. And he's like, I haven't done that. He sounds like a really moral guy. But we also know that Jesus' teachings on the law say that if you've done hatred in your heart, you've committed murder. If you've lusted in your heart, you've committed adultery. So maybe he hasn't kept it as well as he thinks. Lastly, his response to Jesus I've done all this stuff. What do I still lack? That is a great, spiritually sensitive question to ask. He understands that there is something missing. Even after all that he's done, it's still something missing. But then he goes away sad because he's not willing to take the step that Jesus calls him to. He's a gray character. Many of us maybe feel like we're gray characters. We do some good things, we do some bad things, but Jesus makes a comment in the very beginning of this conversation, at the very end of his conversation with this man, that brackets the whole conversation and changes it from a gray conversation to a black and white one. Notice what he says in verse 17. And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. You see, this man is asking a question from moral relativism. I gotta be a good person based on what society says. I gotta be a good person based on what culture says. This culture was Jewish. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 the standard for goodness is much, much higher than that. The standard of goodness is God alone. You compare yourself with him. And we know that this is what he's thinking because at the very end of it, he says, Jesus said to him, this is verse 21, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give it to the poor. Goodness, perfection. Jesus says, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. It's very clear that Jesus is taking this man's worldview and moving it into a different level. Good and perfect frame the entire conversation. You see, it's not against God that this rich young man's moral, morality, his worldview is measured. It's against something else. And you can probably sum it up with the word keeping. His understanding of the world revolves around keeping. One, it's very obvious he wants to keep his stuff. Now, there's nothing in this passage to make us think he has done anything to, to gain this wealth in, a, in an inappropriate way. He's either inherited it, his father was a rich young man, his grandfather was a rich young man, his great-grandfather was a rich young man, and so he's a rich young man. Or he's worked hard and he's earned it. He has a right to it. And so he feels like he has a right to keep it. I've earned this or I'm entitled to it. I can keep it. That's the way it works. And that's fine. But he also revolves his world around keeping the commandments, right? That's his morality. If I keep the commandments, then I'm a good person. His whole world is revolved around keeping things. Do the, follow the rules. Do the right thing. His whole life revolves around keeping. And this translates into him earning things. If you do the right thing, if you play the game the right way, if you follow the rules... If you keep the rules, then you will get things and you are entitled to keep them as well. Keeping leads to keeping. And this is why he goes away sad. It's not just because he's wealthy. It's because Jesus has taken his worldview and said, your worldview is too small. Your understanding of the way the world works doesn't work. 
He's asked not just to give away his possessions, but he's asked to give away his understanding of how the world works. And if we're honest, our ears should probably perk up at this point. Because Jesus is not just talking to a rich young man in the first century. He's talking to us. We're rich. We are wealthy people. We are rich people. You are closer to the 1% than you are to the 100. Most of us in this room, get your head around this, most of us have more comfort, more security, and more purchasing power than this man had. Think about that. He was called rich. And most of us do not define our goodness by God, but we embrace a relativism. We define it by what we keep. What rules do we keep? What societal understandings do I follow? What cultural norms do I hold on to? Because if I do those things, then I get to keep stuff. Then I earn things. I deserve the things I had. I work hard. Maybe I'm generous, but I'm generous to the point only that it doesn't impair my social standing. It doesn't impair my comfort, my security, and my long-term happiness. I've earned what I get to have. I get to keep it. It's mine. You see, what you keep has a way of lying to you. It's very popular these days to buy things that are ethical, right? This is one of the ways it lies to us. We'll think, oh, some sweet women in Kenya made this handbag, and so I can buy it because I'm really supporting them, even though the truth of the matter is, like, we just want the handbag, and we don't really care who made it. Guys, we do the same thing. Maybe you like a handbag, I don't know. But we have a way of lying to ourselves. We're supporting a good thing, right? Or I can give this money away, I can give to the poor, and I can write it off for my taxes so I get a benefit out of it. I've earned what I have. Wealth has a way of lying to us. It's a way of misleading you into thinking you're doing something right. And this is what the disciples believed. We'll get into this in a second, but they're basically going to say, oh my gosh, if rich people can't be saved, then who can be saved? Because they understood that God's blessing was poured out on people who did the right thing, and God's blessing often had material uh, evidences. Rich people were blessed by God, and those who were poor, or those who were disabled, or those who had something happen to them, they had done something wrong. They were being punished. In fact, there's an instance where Somebody even asked Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? And again, we are not quite that superstitious, but we think in similar terms. We think if I'm a good citizen, if I play the game the right way, if I'm a good person, then I'm going to get things. There's going to be rewards for being the kind of person that society wants me to be. If I keep the rules, I get to keep the stuff. That's what we think. If I live the right way, if I do the right thing, if I obey society's rules, if I work hard, if I listen to my doctor, my financier, my pastor, my therapist, I'm going to be happy, I'm going to be healthy, I'm going to be successful, and I'm going to be rich. And that's the way we live our lives. If I keep the rules, I get to keep the stuff. If I keep everything, I get to keep everything. And that is one way to approach your money. That's one way to approach your stuff. And Jesus was challenging that idea then, and he's still challenging that idea now. So Travis, what do you want me to do? Like, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to just give it all away? Is that what you're saying here? Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the idea of leaving everything. Let's talk about leaving everything. Verse 23, and Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And then Peter said in reply, See, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? This is one of those great occasions in Scripture where Jesus explains what just happened to us. He doesn't leave any room for doubt. He's saying that this man's wealth got in the way of him entering the eternal kingdom. 
And we know he's talking about eternal life. We know he's talking about the kingdom of God and eternal life because of what happens in the beginning. He asks Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? What do I have to do to get it? And so the kingdom of God and eternal life in this passage are the same thing. This man's money made him miss out on an eternity with the Father. That's what Jesus says. That's the barrier that he faced. He valued his possessions over the salvation of his soul. Now, what should be eye-opening to us is that Jesus repeats his statement. This was an era when papyrus was used to write with, okay? You wrote on papyrus, which means they didn't just have a printing press. You got to wait like 1,500 years for that. What they had was a piece of parchment that they would write on, papyrus that they would write on, And so if they wrote something twice, it was significant. So Jesus says it's difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom. And he says, no, 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 wait. It's actually impossible. Now, there's two temptations here with this passage. One, the temptation is to explain away what Jesus is saying. Or we give away everything we have. Those are the two choices we feel like we have before us, right? And both of them are different forms of the same thing, different forms of leaving everything behind. We either leave behind Jesus' teaching or we leave behind our stuff. That's one of the two. Now, the temptation to leave behind Jesus' teaching is not that we ignore it because we're good Christians. We want to follow the rules, right? It's part of the last point that we talked about. And so what we do is we find sophisticated way to do biblical gymnastics to explain away the passage. One of our favorites is to say, this doesn't apply to me because this specific person in history was really attached to his wealth, but I'm not. I'm not attached to my possessions like he was. Well, if Jesus asked you to give everything away, what would you do? Maybe we're closer to him than we think. The other thing we do is we say, oh, I'm not that rich. This applies to someone like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, right? The really rich people. It's all about them. There's always somebody else richer that this could apply to. Another thing we do is we try to explain away the illustration. So Jesus talks about this camel going through the eye of the needle. And uh, it's been said that the eye of the needle was this gate in the wall of Jerusalem, and it was a really small gate, right? Some of you have heard this before, it's a really small gate. And for the camel to go through this gate, it had to get down on its knees and it had to like kind of waddle through. I don't know how it works. I've never seen a camel on its knees crawling, so I have no visual idea how that functions. The problem with this, and again, it, it, it preaches really well, because what it sounds like is, oh, the camel gets on its knees, it's submissive, and so I submit to Jesus. I get to keep my stuff, but I'm going to submit to Jesus. Problem with this, two things. One, archaeologically, we've never found a really tiny gate in the wall of Jerusalem that fits this description. So that's a problem. Two, is this story is told in all three synoptic gospels, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If this eye of the needle was an actual gate and it was named the eye of the needle, that's a proper noun, which means in Greek, they would have used the same expression each time. The problem is Matthew, Mark, and Luke use different words for eye of the needle. In fact, in two of the gospels, they use a different word for needle altogether. It's not even the same kind of needle. One's a sewing needle and the other one's something else. This isn't what what it means. It preaches well, but it's not what it means. The bottom line is regardless of what you think Jesus was asking this rich young man, his teaching about rich people and their difficulty receiving eternal life 100% applies to us today. He says it is impossible for rich people to acquire eternal life, full stop. That's what he says. Are you sweating yet? Because you should. So if that's the case, are we going to full ascetic, Travis? Am I supposed to get tonsured like a monk, give everything away, go to the desert, leave everything behind? Well, that is an option, but there's problems there too. Notice what Peter says. Verse 27, Peter said in reply, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? So Peter, Peter's taking this opportunity to elevate his status because what he's telling Jesus is this guy won't leave his stuff, but we did. Well, it's not exactly the same thing. Jesus is telling the rich young man, I want you to sell everything you have, 
give it away, and you will not have access to it in the future. This man is losing everything. Peter, yes, he has left everything behind. Peter, James, John, Andrew, the boys, they left everything. But we see numerous times in scripture where they go back to it. Like there are times when Peter's fishing boat actually get, gets used by Jesus. It becomes like the company car. And they just like take it back and forth across the lake. After Jesus is crucified and resurrected, you know what Peter does? He goes back to fishing. Now, yes, Maybe they liquidated Jesus' ministries, incorporated, and bought a fishing boat with the proceeds. But I don't think that's what's happened. I think Jesus actually told them to leave behind their nets, but don't lose track of them because we're going to use them later. It's a different kind of leaving. So Travis, what, what is Jesus saying here? You're not going to let me ignore his teaching, but you're also telling me I don't have to give everything away. What, what are we talking about here? In order to follow Jesus, you are going to have to leave something behind. There is something, probably a lot of somethings, and probably for most of us it revolves around a possession that we have, that we derive our security, our comfort, our identity. And Jesus is saying, you're going to have to leave that behind to follow me. Now again, We've just pointed out that there's different kinds of leaving behind. Some of it is full-on abandonment. Like, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to leave it behind. Maybe a, uh, an addiction, a sinful activity, whatever it is. Yeah, you leave that behind. You don't come back to it. Other cases, it's something you can't leave behind. I had a couple come up to me after the second service, and we're like, so I derive a lot of my significance from my marriage. Am I supposed to leave my spouse? No. Like, a lot of us parents, like dads, right? Uh, when you watch your kid out on the, on the, on the, the, the football field or the soccer field and, and you're like dying inside because you want them to do really well, some of that is because you love them and you want them to do really well. But part of it too is like, I'm living vicariously through my kid. Like their goals are my goals. Their homers are my homers. I can't leave my kid and be like, sorry, son. Daddy loves you too much, so he's gonna go live in a desert and you're never gonna see him again. It doesn't work like that. Some things that you have to leave behind, you actually need to leave them behind. And it's not necessarily just sinful things. Some portion of our material possessions may fall into that. All of your material possessions may fall into that. Depends on what God's leading you to do. I can't answer that for you. But in some cases, it's just taking that thing and saying, Lord Jesus, you know what this means to me, and you need to tell me what to do with it. Because that's the other problem with the rich young man. It's not just that he has money. It's that he doesn't like Pete Jesus telling him what to do with his money. Because this tells us why it's impossible for rich people to acquire salvation on their own. Rich people have a hard time following Jesus for two reasons. One, it's because we have a lot of stuff to leave behind. So when you're wealthy... You can go out and you can buy something to get you significance, like whatever it might be. Like, like I want a new car. I want a new house. You can, you can get excited about something and go buy it, right? And when that thing proves to be disappointing, rich people have this wonderful option to then go buy something else that they think is going to be significant. And then when that thing is disappointing, lather, rinse, repeat. So one of the things that happens to us rich people is that when we buy something, well, we've got so much money that we can spend a lot of time burning through everything that might give us happiness before we realize that it's only Jesus that gives us happiness. And some of us believe that cognitively, but you don't believe that experientially. You're still trying to find significance in your stuff. Being poor, you might be able to buy one or two things, and then when those things prove disappointing, you don't have any more money. You're like... Jesus, I need help. The second reason why it is impossible to acquire eternal life for a rich person is exactly what rich young uh, man experienced. We don't like people telling us what to do with our stuff. It's the self-sufficiency. Money gives you this great opportunity to take care of yourself. And what's more is we are really proud of the fact that we can take care of ourselves, that we're self-sufficient. We take pride in it. Take pride in our ability to get by without anybody's help. Self-sufficiency 
and options, endless options, are the reason why it is really hard, why it's impossible for a rich person to acquire eternal life. This is why Jesus tells us in Matthew 16, 24, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Everything you need to know about why it's hard for a rich person to follow Jesus is in that sentence. Deny yourself. We just talked about it. It's really hard for a rich person to deny ourselves. Why? We have access to so much stuff. Clubs, communities, uh, uh, places of influence, and then stuff. So much stuff. Take up. Take up your cross. It's really hard to take up the cross when you've taken up so much other stuff already. I don't have time to take up the cross. I got this thing at nine. I got this thing at 10. I got to work 80 hours a week to support my lifestyle. How are you supposed to take up something else when your hands are already so full? And then follow me. Again, we just talked about it. Rich people aren't followers, they're leaders. And they're expected to be. Our society expects them to be. Our society expects them to chart us on the right course. Our church expects that too. One of the really only comforting things in this passage is found in verse 26. With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. No one can acquire salvation. Nobody can earn it. No one can merit it. But the reason why the poor are closer to the kingdom is because they understand dependency and they understand trusting in God for everything they need. And it's something we rich people have a hard time getting our heads around. Rich people are not accustomed to dependency and trusting in other people. And it's why we struggle. It's why coming to the Lord is so hard. It's why trusting him is so hard even after we've come to the Lord. We have pride in not taking that posture of submission. You see, both for the rich and the poor, we need God's grace. The poor are just more accustomed to accepting it than we are. But no one deserves salvation. This is why the Son, this is why the Father sent the Son into the earth to die for us, to rescue us, to redeem us. You've wandered into this room today hoping for a good teaching. Maybe as a dad, you're like, man, I need something to help me be a better dad this week. You got a little more than you bargained for. At the same time, teach your children that wealth is not everything. Where do you derive your significance from? Where do you derive your importance from? Maybe a better question is if you were to lose something, what's something that if you were to lose it, you wouldn't be you anymore? That's the thing. That's the thing you got to leave behind. Whether literally leave it behind, get rid of it, or submit it to Christ and let him tell you what to do with it. Let him tell you what to do with your career. It's not just about climbing a ladder. Let him tell you what to do with your family. What's your family for? What's the purpose of having kids? Is it to leave a legacy? An inheritance? Is it to raise up little scholars and little athletes? Is it to raise up disciples? Let him tell you what to do with your sex life, who you sleep with, when you sleep with them what you watch, what you think about. You let him derive that for you. Let him tell you what to do with your money. And this is the only time I'm going to talk about this today. You tell him what to give. You let him tell you what to give. You let him tell you what to do with your time, who you're going to serve, where you're going to serve, being involved in a connect group, in a community with other believers, your time in the word. You let him tell you those things. Travis, you've told me today, I can either keep everything or I can leave everything. And honestly, there were a couple times this week, I thought about just leaving it here and being like, pick one. But I don't think that's where Jesus leaves the conversation because there's a third option here. There's a third component. I don't want to say it's an option, but it's a component. And it's the opportunity to receive everything. Receive everything. Verse 28, Jesus said to them, truly I say to you in the new world, 
When the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Jesus is answering Peter's implied comparison between themselves and the rich young man. Matthew's the only one that talks about this uh, disciples judging Israel component. And if you want to know what this is about, you can come talk to me afterwards. You don't have time to dive into it uh, today. But everyone talks about this idea of leaving behind for the sake of Christ, for his name and his glory, and being rewarded 100-fold. Now, if anybody that you're going into business with offers you a 100, per, 100 times return on your investment, I, I'm not a business person, okay? So somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. That sounds too good to be true, and you're probably going to wind up in prison. Just a suggestion. Just think about it. Talk to your spouse. But Jesus is saying, you'll get 100 times what you invested in me. What I think Jesus is telling us is, if you leave behind and you follow me, you're not going to be disappointed. You're not going to look back long term. Sometimes you might be like, wow, what did I do? But long term, you're not going to look back and think, oh, I made the wrong choice in following Christ. He's saying you're not going to be disappointed. Not going to be disappointed. Because here's the thing. Christians, uh, people in the West, are uncomfortable talking about wealth and money, so I've made all of you uncomfortable today. But we're also uncomfortable talking about rewards. We don't like to talk about the rewards component of following Christ. The idea that reward is baked into following Jesus. Let me paint a picture for you. Let's say that you were created. We live in an alternate universe where you've been created in the image of God. You are a descendant of Adam and Eve and they ate the fruit and they're dead in their trespasses and sins. And God still says, follow me with your entire life, but you're still condemned and I'm not going to do anything to fix that. I'm not sending the son. You're still condemned regardless of what you do. What would you do? Would you follow Christ? Would you, remember, we guess Christ wouldn't exist at that point in, in the way that we think of him. Would you follow God and do what he commanded if there was no eternal life involved? No. I mean, there might be some weird like cults out there that did it, that like enjoyed the like weird asceticism of it. But for the most part, like Christ has offered us eternal life. And Paul even says, if Christ has not been raised, we're still dead in our sins and we're to be pitied above all men for being fooled. Jesus talks a lot about rewards. He says, seek from him the well done, my good and faithful servant. He says, when you give to little ones, you, great is your reward. It says, rejoice when you're persecuted. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. Jesus talks a lot about it. Why are we so uncomfortable talking about it? You see, God has a great plan for you and for me. He wants to lavish blessing upon us. Now, this does not mean this isn't health and wealth. This isn't prosperity. This doesn't mean you might ever taste another cent more because God's blessing you. It means that the eternal reward, the fruit of the Spirit, the joy of serving your God, those things, those things are what matter. You see, here's the interesting thing. The same Jesus who said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, is the same Jesus who says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Travis, that sounds contradictory. Which is it? Am I supposed to deny or am I supposed to rest? Am I supposed to take up or am I supposed to be weary? Because that cross sounds mighty heavy. Do we follow him or do we come to him? What am I supposed to do? And the answer is yes. Because it's only in denying yourself, taking up your cross and following him and leaving behind everything that you can then come to him and seek his rest when you're weary and when you're burdened. It's only when you're left behind that he can give you everything that you've been promised. And you see, the script of leaving and receiving is not just for us. Jesus follows the same script. 
Hebrews 12, 2 says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He endured it for the reward. The reward of giving God glory, of having himself glorified, but also this, people that were his enemies, redeemed and rescued and brought into a relationship with him. We are the reward. We're the joy. We're the things that Christ received after his brutal death, burial, and resurrection. You see, the only person who ever had a right to keep everything left it all behind so that we could receive everything. And all you have to do is trust him. All you have to do is put your faith in him. All you have to do is take that thing that you hold on to so tightly and leave it and say, Jesus, take it, take it and do with it what you want. I'm sorry that I held on to it so tight. Forgive me. And odds are you'll probably have to do that multiple times because things have a way of getting their hooks back in us again and again and again. Jesus died to rescue us from self-sufficiency. And until you see that as the cancer that it actually is, your wealth will continue to be a barrier to following Christ with your whole life. Because that's what your wealth tells you, is that you can do it. You're self-sufficient. Are you going to trust him? Are you going to give him your life? Are you going to leave everything behind and follow him? Are you going to do like the rich young man did and you're going to walk out of this room sad because you have great possessions? One of the great scenes in uh, both the book and the movie, The Lord of the Rings, it's at the very end. Frodo's carried the ring for so long and he's standing over the fires of Mount Doom and his best friend is calling out behind him. He says, just let it go. Just let it go. All he has to do is open his hand and it'll drop. And Frodo looks back at his best friend and he says, no. Because he can't let it go. What are you going to do? You stand today on the edge and you can let it go or you can keep holding it. We've done this exercise before. I want to try it again. You can bow your head, close your eyes. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand. Bow your head, close your eyes, and take your palms and just rest them on your knees. Hold them up. Rest them on your knees, just kind of up. And I want you to think about that one thing that you really want to keep. And you know it's the nagging, annoying thing that you've thought of every time I've thought about saying, I've said leaving something behind. It's the thing that annoyingly keeps popping up in your brain. It's that thing that's important to you, that's insignificant to you. It could be money. Probably for many of us, it's something material. It's because faith and material possessions contradict one another in some ways because faith is being certain of what you do not see. And so we want something that we can hold on to, we can latch on to. So maybe it's something material, but just think of that. And then I want you to talk to God and I want you to talk to him about this thing that's in your hands. And be honest about it. He already knows the place it has in your life. Talk to him about it and say, Lord, this is, you know this is important to me. You know this is significant to me. You know that this probably has a larger place in my life than it should have. And then I want you to take your hands and I want you to turn them over. Just turn them over, palms down. And tell the Lord, Lord, I want to let it go. Or Lord, I am letting it go. Or maybe you're not even there. Maybe you're just at the point where you're like, Lord, I want to want to let this go. But I don't know how. Lord, I want to turn this loose because I see that I have to leave something behind. I got to leave it behind to follow you more closely. And then I want to take your palms, turn them back up and say, Lord, I want to receive what you have for me. I want to take what you have for me. Now you can open your eyes. This is a great exercise. It's, it's nice and interactive, and you can just leave it here for the day if you want. Or this is a practice you can do regularly. Because again, things have that way of getting their hooks in us again and again and again. I would encourage you each day of the week, when you spend time with the Lord, when you're in prayer, or maybe just get to work, whatever it is, wherever you are where that thing tends to rise up that gets in your way of following Jesus, maybe it's time, whatever it is, take it. Maybe there's an actual thing that you can hold on to. And just repeat that exercise of keeping everything, leaving everything, and then receiving everything. And do it again and again and again. 
Again, there's nothing magical about it, but maybe it just help you physically engage something that maybe is a little more um, abstract. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we have before us an opportunity to leave behind those things which get in our way of following you. And for many of us, Lord, it's our money. It's our wealth. It's the options. It's the access that our money gives us, Lord. And so I pray that our hearts would not be too hard, our eyes would not be too blind to see the danger that our wealth proposes. I pray that we'd have the courage. I pray that you would give us the encouragement to leave it behind. Lord, it's a hard thing. I pray for each heart in this room that's confronted by something they didn't expect to be confronted with today. I pray that you would comfort them and encourage them and bless them. I pray, Spirit, that you would empower them to do what needs to be done. We love you, Lord. Amen.